All right, what's up everybody? This is Ryan here, and you're watching the uh, second version of episode 24 of Ask a Programmer Live. So I do have a specific lesson in mind for today, but I thought I would ramble a little bit about why this is the second version of episode number 24. And just give me a moment to organize some windows here. <clears throat> Yeah, what's up everybody? How are you all doing? See, we got a number of people joining me right at the start here. What's up, the Apache, Patrick, and Trax. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, uh, let's get started. So just a little bit of rambling, pre-show banter. Um, I don't know if anyone watched the uh, big boxing fight uh, last night, Canelo versus Billy Joe Saunders. Um, I have to admit the card overall was terrible. Uh, the first three fights were just not great. The The third one was okay, but uh, they stopped it too early. So um, pretty disappointing. I'm, I'm glad I'm only paying 20 bucks a month for my DAZN su subscription. Anyways, I know you're not here to talk about boxing. I'm a big boxing fan, but that's just something that I'm really into. So anyways, um, Trax mentions... Uh, he presumably is uh, mowing the lawn and listening to the awesome content. That's a really great thing that I wanted to just share here. A lot of times, like when I'm uh, listening to uh, Douglas Schmidt talk about the visitor pattern in C++ and stuff like that, I'll be doing something else on the side. And I call that passive learning. And I think it's actually a really underrated way to learn. All right, anyways, um, let's get started with today's main lesson. I'll try and get through it fairly quickly, but you know me, I ramble. It's part of the reason why the show is not terrible, or the main reason why the show is terrible, depending on your perspective. But uh, yeah, apparently other people were watching SNL. I read in the headlines that uh, Elon Musk admitted that he has Asperger's, and I have to say, I, I know that feeling. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to try and get through this fairly quickly. And the reason why is that the points I'm about to be making are actually pretty simple. There's nothing really complicated here, but the main issue is that some of the ways we go about achieving this principle that I'm going to teach are quite complicated. So. Uh, the main topic for today, let me just zoom in here, is inversion of control. And I know for some of you hardcore um, solid principle people, uh, clean architecture people, that you'll know what inversion of control is and what it means. Or maybe you have like a fuzzy definition of what it means. And to tell you the truth, um, I don't think the name of this principle really helps people a whole lot to understand what it means. I kind of understand what it means, but it it's just very vague and um, obscure sounding. So my goal for today's lesson is to explain what inversion of control is, uh, the different ways we achieve it. So primarily, it we'll see it's comprised of three things. Um, one of them being, uh, or two of them being pr pretty much the same goal, service, lo service locator and dependency injection. And then there's a third element which people really need to understand in order to make this principle really useful. And that is the usage of abstractions. And when I say abstractions in Java or Kotlin, I'm generally talking about interfaces, but it could be an abstract class potentially, but usually it's an interface. So let's get started. The first thing I want to do is uh, I wanted to start with a simplified definition. Um, if you were to look up the definition of inversion of control, um, I don't actually remember what it is. It's so vague and technical. But uh, let me give you my definition of inversion of control. And one final thing before I proceed. Um, I get so many questions about dependency injection, which is good. Most of the questions I get about it um, are from people who've looked at Dagger and uh, or some other dependency injection framework. And they think that um, 
Dagger or this other framework or whatever framework it is, is doing something very magical and special. And um, it's important to understand that um, they're really not. They're doing something that you would, you could potentially write yourself, but there's a situation where an application gets so complicated or large that it makes more sense to have a framework do it for you. So scale is really important. Anyways, if you want to learn more about that side of things, ask a specific question later, because I'm going to keep this very high level and we're going to focus on what this thing is and what the benefits are. And I'm going to try to use as little jargon as possible, but it's kind of, it's, it's impossible not to use a bit of jargon. Inversion of control is basically summarized by me. <laughs> this is how I would summarize it. Um, a thing, I'm going to put that in capitals. Right off the bat, when I say thing, what do I mean? Usually a class. It could be a function, but usually I'm talking about a class. Um, if I use the word software entity, then you might be confused that I'm talking about some kind of Robert Martin style clean architecture thing. Uh, so that's not what I mean. So we're just going to say thing. It means an object, a class, something like that. A thing should not build the things. Let's capitalize that again. A thing should not build the things which it uses. Instead, it should be given those things at runtime. Okay. Now, if you're wondering what injection means when you've heard dependency injection, it, it actually just means like giving something its stuff through a function call. And that function call is generally going to be a constructor function. So if you ever have been confused about what actually does dependency injection mean, it means exactly what I'm telling you here. A thing should not be, uh, it means giving a thing the things it uses instead of the thing building its own things that it uses. Hopefully that's not too confusing. The problem with type theory is that we're always dealing with things, and that's why I'm using the word thing. So this is really what it means. And uh, like I said, we can get into talks about the frameworks to do this, but understand that all of the frameworks you're using, they don't do anything magical in the sense of under the hood, they'll just be calling a constructor, or if it's field injection, they'll just be calling a getter, or a setter, rather. So. This is really what dependency injection is all about. Now, inversion of control combines a few things. Um, it's, it's kind of a vague. Uh, MGH says, basically, a class should not be responsible for creation of other objects. Yes, if, it, if that class uses those objects. This is the important thing. You will have classes which create things. The classes which create things shouldn't use the things. The classes which use the things shouldn't create the things. Um, but before I proceed, it's important to understand this is a principle, not a rule. So I'm going to talk a little bit in a minute about a good situation to apply this principle, but sometimes it's OK not to follow this rule. Anyways, um, so what I wanted to talk about is uh, let's let's jump right into that. Um, what is a good situation to apply this rule uh, of inversion of control? Um, and there's, I've heard different software teachers explain this in a different way. Um, I've heard Uncle Bob say there's kind of like two different kinds of things, software entities. Again, generally we're talking about classes, uh, but don't limit your perspective only to classes because, you know, a lot of us are Kotlin programmers or programmers in multi-paradigm languages. Um, and these things do have carryover to functional programming. What is a good situation to apply this rule? Um, Uncle Bob would say there are plugins and there are things which are plug into. If we broadly categorize it, any kind of class into two categories, plugins and things which are plugged into. So the plugin is the um, low level database driver or the system service. And then the thing which is plugged into is the thing which tells that low level tool what to do, uh, essentially. 
How I like to explain it is I like to broadly categorize my code into two kinds of objects. Um, I generally use the term, uh, so decision makers and drivers is what I like to say. So for a decision maker, let's actually just jump right into some code here. Um, a decision maker, in my perspective, I generally define it as a class which will be coordinating multiple drivers. When I say driver, it's kind of like a, what Uncle Bob means by plugin. It's something that has a specific role, like something that makes a database do what it's supposed to do. Like a great example, you want to use room. So you set up your, your boilerplate, you set up your DAO, and then you're going to have some kind of class which is accessing that DAO, data access object. Um, and that's like a driver in, in the general sense of the word. Um, it's the class which uh, talks to Firebase. It's the class which um, holds reference to your retrofit uh, API and, and makes calls and stuff like that. So a driver is not going to make decisions about the big picture of the application's data flow. A decision maker is. So in this case, I've pulled up uh, what's a class called task view logic. And this is short for like presentation logic. So this is essentially a presenter. Oh no. My internet, don't you dare. My internet just, bitrate just went down. <laughs> oh, that would drive me crazy if I lost my internet again. Anyways, we're gonna carry on. So um, what we have here is a class, which is a decision maker. So it's got these dependencies. It's got a view, it's got a view model, and it's got a storage, which is like your repository. And this is, in my opinion, a perfect case to apply our principle of a thing should not build the things which it uses, instead it should be given those things at runtime. So this is kind of the main point here. Um, for things like drivers, you don't. I don't think you generally need to apply inversion of control, i.e. Um, you, you have more flexibility. Um, sometimes it's okay to hide some of the build logic, I call it, or keep some of it in like a driver. It's gonna depend on the situation. But what I'm trying to say here is when you have a decision maker class, so this is generally like a, a presenter, a view model. It could be a complicated interactor or use case. It could be a complicated repository, uh, which has to coordinate multiple different data sources. We're really just playing around with words here, but we're talking about a class which has several things plugged into it, several dependencies. And as Uncle Bob would say, it coordinates the dance of those uh, those plugins. So uh, moving on, there's one other, there's really three elements that we need to pay attention to for this principle in general, because if we say that inversion of control means dependency injection, that's kind of wrong. Uh, dependency injection is a way to achieve inversion of control, but there's another way to achieve that. And then there's another missing element, which a lot of people uh, I think will benefit from, I might kind of blow your mind a little bit for some of you, because what I'm about to explain uh, is simple if you can grasp it, but very powerful. But before I get to that, let's talk about two things, dependency injection and a service locator. I already talked about dependency injection, so I'm just going to reiterate what I just said. Dependency injection is a uh, I got into a Twitter discussion about this. I don't like the term because when I just say giving something its dependencies through a constructor or a getter or setter, that's pretty easy to understand. When I say dependency injection, at least in my case, I thought, what does that mean? Is there some kind of like reflection going on or how does it like inject the dependencies? And when you have something like uh, a dagger, for example, which hides so much stuff from you, um, it can be tempting to think that there's some kind of magic going on. But believe you me, as the Brits would say, um, when we're talking about dependency injection, we're talking about calling a constructor and giving something its dependencies through a constructor or using getters and setters, which would be field injection. It's not magical. It's really not. 
what these libraries do is they hide things from you, and sometimes that's a good thing. That's all that dependency injection essentially is. For um, a service locator, in its most simplest implementation, it's actually very much like a data model. So here I have one on screen. It's a class, a container, um, a data class, or not necessarily a data class, but it it's just a class which holds on to dependencies. And uh, in this case, this thing is called storage service locator. It's initially given a context object, and all it does is it uses that context object to create the backend dependencies. So this thing, if I recall correctly, uses room. Um, it looks like it uses maybe two. Let me actually just look in the back end, um, local day storage. Okay, so this uses file storage, and then I think the tasks are stored in a room database. No, this application only uses file storage. All oh, right, because yeah, that actually makes sense. Um, there's a finite number of hours in a day. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. <laughs> I apologize. Um, but yeah, it it hides the creation of the backend stuff, and it holds on to those things. And then what I do here is I actually pass my service locator into the class which uses it. So we're actually combining dependency injection in the service locator. You don't always need to do this. Sometimes it's useful if the class which is the decision maker, the class which you're injecting or giving the dependencies to, has a lot of dependencies. Instead of giving them all the dependencies, you can just give it your service locator, and then they're all available through there. And then that way, if you need to like add another serv uh, another service, it doesn't actually break the class which is um, depending on the service locator. I'm getting into another principle called the open closed principle, which I'll talk about probably next week. So I'll, I'll leave that point just for people to think about. Okay. So that's really all that dependency injection and the service locator are. Uh, there's no need to really overcomplicate it. Uh, and please understand that this is what Dagger and all these other ones are doing under the hood. Um, now, uh, the next question is, what is the other part of this principle of inversion of control? And it's one of my favorite topics ever. It's a topic which, uh, sorry, I had a mustache hair going into my mouth. That's uh, facial hair problems. Um, abstractions, this is a topic which is so important that I think most people listening don't even understand how important this is for every information processing system, including a human brain. But I'm not going to go into the philosophical stuff. When I say abstractions in computing, what I'm really talking about for like Kotlin and Java is interfaces. It could be an abstract class as well, and you can use inheritance as a mechanism for abstraction. But generally speaking, we're talking about interfaces it is often very, very useful. So when you combine either dependency injection or the service locator pattern or both, with the usage of interfaces or abstractions, then you get something special. Something very special happens. And this is a very important thing. When you combine these three, so at least one of dependency injection or service locator and the usage of abstractions, when you combine these three things, you get loose coupling which is a very important term. I don't like to use too much jargon, but if you don't know what loose coupling is, this is a concept you really want to understand. So, I, I love your name, Mr. Pants. Um, anyways, uh, loose coupling is incredibly important to understand. So, um, the analogy I like to give for loose coupling and separation of concerns, kind of the same thing, is actually a sidewalk. So I don't know, maybe you're a Asperger case like me, and your brain is like constantly examining things and asking questions. This one day, many years ago, and this is a true story, I was walking to work to my job as a suit salesperson. Uh, I used to sell fine clothing. Um, it's how I learned to talk because before that I was like a super introverted, awkward kid. 
And now I'm like still super introverted and awkward, but I learned how to talk to people, so I'm, I'm good. I'm not sure, can you hear the Canada geese in the background? Anyways, so I was walking to work and I noticed how some of the sidewalks on my walk to work were made with squares of concrete. Sidewalks made of squares. And some of the sidewalks were just a continuous piece of asphalt, or as they say in America, asphalt, <laughs> or concrete. So I wondered about like, why, why would you make sidewalks out of square pieces? And then it occurred to me that this is actually the same principle here as separation of concerns, or in this case for loose coupling. By making your sidewalk made of a set of squares instead of a continuous piece of concrete or asphalt, you're able to build these different parts of the system in isolation of each other. If one of them breaks, it doesn't necessarily break the whole system. You can just replace that one part that is broken. Um, you could even hypothetically build each part in uh, different parts of the city and then put them together in the end. So parts can be built in isolation. So let me just reiterate that little point. I gave you, try to give you an analogy to think about loose coupling and why it's useful. But here's why loose coupling is useful. So um, things become easier to build in isolation. So what does this really mean? Let me show you something in code and hopefully this makes a little more sense. Let's get a little more concrete. Notice, so these are all interfaces. I have my decision maker class and I'm giving it its dependencies. And these things are interfaces. This creates an interesting situation. So this class here, task list view logic, has no dependencies to any third party libraries or Android framework code, none. It's pure Kotlin, pure Java as standard library. That's really useful. What that does for me is it means I can by way of giving it interfaces, give it fake implementations of its dependencies. I can give it a fake storage mechanism, a fake database, a fake file storage. I can give it a fake view model. I can give it a fake view. And then what that allows me to do, because I've combined interfaces, or sorry, abstractions, interfaces, and I've used dependency injection, it becomes super easy for this thing to be tested. I hope I have test classes in this. I don't remember if I have test classes. Let me just see. Um, day logic. Okay, well, this example isn't great, but it will it will work. Um, so here, here I have a different uh, presenter and I just want to show you how this works. So you can create fakes, and this is what a mocking library does um, in the simplest way of explaining it. You create a fake version of the dependencies. When you apply dependency injection and you use interfaces, it becomes so easy to do that that you just, in your test class, make a fake class which implements the interface, and then you just tell it what to do. Um, you could also use a mocking library it's about, it's generally the same idea. You create the fake versions and then you can verify the correctness, the function of the decision maker class, even if you haven't built any of its dependencies, any of the production dependencies. So just take a moment to understand that. When you loosely couple your code, you can build and verify different parts of the system independently of each other. You could be working in a team where your job is to build the decision maker and uh, your cousin is supposed to build the, uh, the database driver or whatever. You guys, you, or you people, can, guys is a gender neutral term where I come from. You guys can verify this thing independently of each other um, completely. In fact, as long as you both keep the same contract, so the same interface, you don't really have to care about what your cousin is doing and, and vice versa, as long as you two respect the contract. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk for too much longer. Let's just kind of wrap it up. So using dependency injection and or service locator and abstractions, 
which I take to be in general what inversion of control really means, those three things, um, then you get loose, loosely coupled code. There's different ways to promote loose coupling, but generally speaking, the best way to promote loose coupling is abstractions. So I'm going to summarize this by actually just explaining it in a different way. What are we really doing here? when we're applying this principle of a thing should not build the things it uses. Instead, it should be given those things at runtime. Well, I have a theory that um, the single most important principle in software architecture and design is separation of concerns. And this uh, a word which people like to use as a stand-in for separation of concerns, which is fine, is modularity. I like separation of concerns because to me it's very clear what that means, whereas modularity, yeah, I get it, you're building different modules, but that's slightly less useful to me anyways. So if you accept this as a working hypothesis that separation of concerns is ultimately what we're always talking about in software architecture, then uh, dependency injection uh, and, uh, well, dependency injection in general and service locator, which I like to call those two things build logic, the logic required to build things. That's the term I like to use, but understand not everyone else does. Uh, so build logic is just another application of separation of concerns. And when we go back to my original definition, building a thing and using a thing, those are different concerns. So when we're talking about dependency injection and inversion of control, what we're really doing is we're just applying separation of concerns again. And we're saying, I'm going to make one special object or thing which has the role of building dependencies and providing those dependencies. So in that case, that would be my injector class, itchy nose, not picking my nose. And um, let me just show you, like, for example, uh, what did I call it in this application here? Um, task, I know it's here somewhere. I think I call it injector. There we go. Um, so this is one of those classes. So this is a little injector I wrote. It's not a class actually, in this case, it's a top level extension function uh, called build components. So it takes in an activity and a service locator, and then it builds the decision maker class. So we're really just saying this logic to build the decision maker sits in a separate part of the application. We're just pulling it out of the class itself and putting it somewhere else. And that somewhere else could be dagger or hilt or coin. It could be something you handwrite yourself, but that's really all we're doing. So my friends, my cousins, that is my lesson on inversion of control. And I will move into Q&A and uh, hopefully that was useful. And hopefully if that was useful and made sense to you, you can go around and help uh, other people because it's quite bizarre how um, there's really two topics I get asked about all the time. One of them is model view view model, and then the other one is dependency injection. And dependency injection is quite likely the thing I'm asked about most. I end up talking about it almost every live stream. So that's why I like to try and explain it in different ways and give people different uh, perspectives on it. Um, to avoid what I went through, which is just being very confused by Dagger and what it actually does. So, and by the way, I, I'm not trying to crap on Dagger, okay? Uh, if you know how to use it, it's great. And uh, it's particularly useful, in my opinion, in larger and complex projects where the handwriting, the logic that I showed you, becomes difficult and tedious. So, hopefully that was useful. We will move into... Q&A now after I drink some coffee.
Uh, Nemenya, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, to be honest, uh, says, to be honest, tried to understand inversion of control, never understood it, even if I used DI plus abstraction. Do you understand it now? Okay, so um, Patrick, uh, if you're still around, Patrick had a question which I wanted to get into. Um, and this is actually a good segue because I have a project open which demonstrates a tool. Um, so Patrick asks, hi, all this is an out of uh, off the topic question, which is fine. Um, since async task is deprecated, what alternative ways could I use? Uh, I mean, easy like async task. So really this question, um, I agree with the Apache. Uh, um, so there's really two things. So in Java, I suggest the executors framework is terrific. Um, you'll find a lot of, um, there's a lot of things in Android and Kotlin itself that under the hood uses the executors framework. Um, it's Java standard library, so you don't need to import any library to do this, um, which is why it's a great stand-in for async task. And I would, I haven't actually looked at the async task implementation in a while, but I would hazard a guess that they actually use the executors framework under the hood, but I haven't looked at it. So um, that's just an educated guess. Um, and then obviously in Kotlin, uh, you can use coroutines. So, um, all right, great. Cousin is still here. So um, I would like to actually ask you, Patrick, what, what are you using? Are you using Kotlin or Java? Because I, I can give you an example of either, uh, but I'd rather give you the example that uh, is useful. Also, Nemenia says, if that is really all that it is, yes. Um, that's how I understand it. Uh, we're talking about um, inversion of control. Um, I, I tr always try to understand things. I'll just talk about this while I'm waiting to hear back from Patrick. Um, I always try to understand things in a very concrete and specific way, uh, devoid of too much words. Um, and in my case, uh, this is really, um, here, let me give you, let me suggest something, Nemanja. Um, look up, uh, look up Martin Fowler's blog on inversion of control. And if my explanation didn't help you, um, Martin Fowler to me explains it. He's the first person who explained it in a way that made sense to me. Um, and also the first person who mentioned that uh, dependency injection and service locator, uh, or sorry, the term inversion of control is probably not a very useful term. Okay, Patrick is using Java. So let me show you uh, what I do in this application, Patrick. Let me just uh, take a moment to get a proper example going. Okay. Um, let's go to a backend class, uh, task storage. Okay. And just give me one moment here. Okay, I think this should be sufficient for our purposes. Um, and is executors, I'm just remind, I haven't looked at this code in about a year, so I'm just reminding myself of how it works. Just give me a moment. Okay, um, so let me just reread the question in case anyone just joined. So Patrick has asked, uh, what's a good replacement for async task in Java, essentially? Um, obviously, if you're in Kotlin, use coroutines. Um, and something preferably easy. So um, I think the, the answer to this question is the Java executors framework. So before we look at the code, let me just kind of explain it. Um, there's kind of like... Uh, Let's talk about um, from on a scale of like simple slash human. Let's actually do it like this. Um, on a scale of human readable to um, 
low level, low level to high level, basically. Um, we can, at number one, we have, let's say, async task. And then number two, we have the executors uh, framework for Java. And then number three, um, we have the, uh, um, the, the thread, uh, the thread API um, in Java, which is very low level. So highest level, mid-level, very low level. So why would I suggest the executors framework for Java? Um, so you can hypothetically use the thread API. You can create your own threads and runnables and that kind of thing. But to be perfectly on, honest with you, it's almost too low level. Um, if you have a specific reason uh, to do that, you can, but it's a little bit too clunky and low level to work with. Um, you want something that does some of the work for you, um, but is a little more flexible than async task. And the other thing is, as uh, Patrick has mentioned, async, ta async task or async task, depending on how you, I guess I should say async task, um, is uh, deprecated. Well, my suggestion is to use the Java executors framework uh, and that was just my way of explaining that it's slightly more user friendly. It's more user friendly than using the threads API, which is very low level and can be tricky to work with unless you're like a pro C, C++ developer. Um, so to create your executors, you're going to create a class like this thing here, application executors. And this is going to be a, like a container class for the executors that you you want. And I'll explain what the executors are in a high level in a second. Let's just look at this code for a bit. This is a tiny little class. It has two dependencies. And notice we're not using dependency injection here because there's no reason to. Um, it's got these two executor thingies. And how we create them when this class is initialized, I realize this is Kotlin. I do have a Java version, but just bear with me for a moment. Um, I can actually paste the Java version of this code uh, so that you can get some source code that is uh, useful. But for the time being, we've got just a, a class here. And when we want to create these two things that we need here, then uh, we just simply, um, uh, is the stream lagging? Let me know if it is. I think that's what Gen 2 is telling me. Anyways, when we need to create these things, I either use this, uh, this is called the, um, what do you call it? Um, factory method pattern, get me a new single thread executor. So just a single thread. And then I also need to get the main thread. So the important thing here is that this is how you get a hold of the Android's main thread. This is really important. A application executors or executors. This is a Java framework. It's not an Android framework, but the way that we wire it together into Android is um, through the main looper here and the handler. So this is really just this whole block of code here is so that we can get a hook to the Android main thread. This is important. Anyways, um, let's move on. So to use the F executors framework, you create something like this. It doesn't have to be, but this is a handy way to do it. And you can have different kinds of thread pools. So here we're using single um, autocomplete is not helping me here, a single thread. So we're just going to be doing single IO operations. You could do like a, a fixed thread pool, a variable thread pool. You can make this more complicated if you want to. Here we're just making a single call to the file system. And that's why I'm only using a single thread. In the code itself, it looks like this. Um, so the front end class will uh, tell this class, hey, get me the data. So this is a task management application. So get me the tasks. So we call this function and this class here, which is our implementation of the back end storage, is given our application executors class. When it wants to do something useful, but something which needs to not occur on the main thread, then 
we need to jump on to an executor. So I want you to think of this conceptually as when we say exec, which is our executor's um, variable, when we say exec.background or exec.mainthread.execute, we are jumping onto different threads. And this is what async task does for you. Um, do on, it's been so long since I looked at the code for async task, um, do in background or something. Is that what it is in async task? I, it's been years. But the, the do in background thread, if I'm, or function or method, if I'm recalling correctly, is essentially exactly what I'm doing here. So we're saying to our executor's object, um, take the background thread and run the code in this block on a background thread. That's what our execute uh, function is doing. And um, the executor's framework, this executor function or method accepts a runnable. And runnable is just a block of code. So this is a little, this isn't easy if you're not super familiar with concurrent programming, but try not to overthink it. What this line of code does is we're saying, get me a background thread and run the code within the uh, Lambda expression here, this block inside of a background thread. Then once we do the background work, after that work occurs or executes, then we're using our threader, our executor, to jump back onto the main thread to return the result. So if you're into RxJava, this is like, um, uh, what is it? Um, uh, observe on and uh, oh, I can't remember. It's been so long since I wrote RxJava. But you know the way that you observe on and what was the other one? <laughs> I can't remember now. Um, yeah, I can't even remember. Observe on and subscribe on. But so, anyways, uh, this is my suggestion to you as a replacement for async task in Java. Um, it's lightweight enough that you you just create this class. That's all you do. You create this class, and you just copy paste this thing in. And you don't even have to really understand that in order to get a hook to the main thread of a running Android process, you need to use a handler and then get the main looper. This is technical jargon, but this is how we talk. This is how we get a hook to the main thread in a running application, an Android process. And then this is how we create a background thread. One of the ways, in this case, we just need a single background thread. And then this is how you use the thing. You jump onto the background thread, do your background work, and then we jump off of the background thread to report whether it was a successful or failed operation. And here I'm using some Java, or I'm using a function types to report that, but you could just return an object like a, a result wrapper or an either monad as those functional programming nerds, which I consider myself to be, like to call it. So hopefully that's useful. Um, let me just see if I can get the Java version of this code and then paste it uh, into the chat, the link. Where are my repos? Hopefully that wasn't too technical. I, I feel like I went through that pretty quickly and it's not easy if you're, if this is your, if you're kind of a beginner to writing concurrent code, it's not really easy. Okay, is this it? Yes, okay. Um, in the uh, comments, I'm pasting the Java version of the code I just showed you. Um, I built that application both in Java and Kotlin for these kinds of situations. Okay, uh, next question. All right, our friend, our resident uh, Compose expert and attack helicopter, the Apache. 
asks, um, I'm working on Compose Desktop Project with Template, with Dagger, Decompose, and uh, MVVM. Um, have you tried... Uh, have I tried writing Compose tests? So, um, yeah, I'm not going to give a lengthy answer here, Apache. Um, I looked at the Compose testing API on... Um, uh, the documentation, the Android Google developers documentation, or Android developers, and the way they wrote the documentation kind of told me that, hey, we're working on it, this thing is not perfect, and then I tried to use it. Now, admittedly, this was like two or three months ago. Um, it was before Compose was released in beta, and it just looked and performed terribly. So that's all I've really bothered with, um, with Compose. Um, so that's my experience with it. Um, is it because Compose is still in beta? Um, so one perhaps useful thing I can give you here is that um, I don't actually like to write Android UI tests in general. Um, the general approach that I take uh, is to apply um, passive view or um, humble object pattern. And to just explain that in like a minute, um, this is a design pattern where, um, let's pull up, uh, let's say task uh, detail view. I'm apparently very unfamiliar with um, this project here. Our where the heck is our view? Oh, there it is. It was a different color, so I couldn't see it. So um, I try to solve the issue of testing the front, the UI uh, classes, which are tightly coupled to the. Android framework, so generally speaking, UI classes, um, by applying the humble object pattern or the passive view pattern, depending on whose jargon you like to use. And really all that means is that I decompose as basically everything the view does into individual functions. And then I have the presenter coordinate the view. Let's pull up the appropriate presenter. Um, I have it coordinate the view in a very fine-grained way. So essentially the views functions, um, generally speaking, get reduced to like one-liners. And then um, it reduces the necessity of using something like Espresso or the Compose testing um, library. Now I know some people are going to look at that and think I'm just being lazy and I don't want to write uh, UI tests and it's yeah you you can do you can take it that way if you want um, the main thing is that if I was doing mostly UI code in Android yeah I would use RoboElectric and I would use Espresso but it's not most of what I do and um, in my opinion passive view or the humble object pattern if I verify the correctness of my class which coordinates the view and then I test the view very rigorously in uh, instrumented um, integration tests. So in other words I run the application a whole bunch on the device and test the different things. That is a sufficient amount of testing for me. Uh, and there's many situations where like let's take for example um, Where's a, a great example here? Um, here's an example. Um, I could write a test, a test to verify that toast.maketext is behaving the way it should. I could do that, but that's kind of pointless because at that point I'm basically like trying to test the Android framework itself, which isn't really my job. So there's arguments two and four, and what I would say is that if um, Hopefully what will happen with the Compose testing library um, is that I'll be able to, let's pull up a, a screen here, a Compose screen. 
Hopefully I will end up being able to, wow, this is taking forever to load. Hopefully I will end up being able to test um, my composables uh, without having to be stupidly tightly coupled to Android activity classes and stuff. And then I have to use a mocking library like uh, RoboElectric to do that. Um, it's just too much overhead. I prefer to solve that through something like the um, passive view. And one of the ways you can do that in model view view model, the last thing I'll say is that you want to make every single widget um, in the view associated with a particular field in the view model. And what you do there is you lose the reusability of the view model, but you regain fine grained control over the view model. And so that's a judgment call because um, reusability of view models and model view view model is both a feature and a flaw depending on the feature you're building, the, the part of the app that you're building. So anyways, that's my answer there. By the way, what's up, Gentoo? <laughs> My bad, the Apache. Um, MGH asks, uh, completable future works in Android, right? Um, let's see what level of API uh, Java completable future is. I think the support for that has been added. Okay, it's in Java 8, so you should be able to use it uh, in Android. Just out of curiosity, I wonder if I could, um, if it's kind of present here. Let's just fiddle around here for a second. Sorry, I'm in cam whore mode. Um, yep, it's here. Um, so you could also use completable future, uh, just going back to our concurrency thing. Um, I haven't actually personally used it. I've heard of it. Um, but yeah, um, recently Java, I think Java 8 is now fully supported. It used to be that you had to add some Gradle configurations to use Java 8, um, but I don't even think you need to do that anymore. Um, but at the very least, you, you might need to add some configurations for that, but there's a good article um, using Java 8 in Android. There's a good article in the documentation. Um, the article is called Use Java 8 Language Features and APIs. You can just Google it. And sometimes you need to do a bit of configuration, but I feel like they just announced something where you don't really need to do that anymore. All right. So Gentoo has a question. And by the way, thank you, Gentoo, for supporting me by getting a membership to my channel. Uh, with a membership to the Wise-Ass channel, you get something like uh, five or six hours of professionally created uh, courseware and content by yours truly. And uh, a lot of the, like you saw me explaining dependency injection and immersion of control in a way which is hopefully simpler and easier to understand than generally how it's explained. And you can expect a lot of that in my courseware. Um, my courses are also available on Skillshare uh, down in the description box below if you prefer. What you can do is you can click on the link to the Skillshare courses and you'll get access to every course on Skillshare, including every one that I've made, uh, for two months for free. And yes, that is an affiliate link. I get $10 kickback if you just do that. So you don't have to, but if you want to get uh, all my courses for free for two months and any course on Skillshare and you want to give me back ten dollars Which doesn't come out of your pocket do consider clicking on that link anyways um, So uh, Gen 2 How would I sync data with a rest API when using room database for caching? Um, to answer your question um, This is exactly a situation where I would introduce an interactor or a back-end decision maker. So um, oftentimes 
our application flow looks something like this. Um, we have a, a view. We have either a VM or a presenter or a controller, whatever. Um, just some some decision maker, front end decision maker. Um, and then maybe we have like a repository interface or some of you people who don't really do software architecture, you have an activity and it makes direct calls to a database and you really shouldn't do that. Um, but hey, sometimes people are, you know, sometimes people make courses and post them on Udemy and they get beginners to think that the right way to build an application is to stick calls to a database or a retrofit I in API instead of an activity. So I can't really blame people when they get taught the wrong way to do things. But yeah, you'll have like a repository interface and then you'll have your GitHub, or sorry, not GitHub, um, you'll have your retrofit uh, REST adapter. Um, so this is a pretty typical three layer architecture type of thing. Um, and so the question is, how do, how do you sync data with the REST API uh, using Room Database for caching? Um, this is, in my opinion, when you would want to do something like an interactor slash use case in the middle. And I'll show you some code examples in a second. Um, and really what I'm talking about here is on the front end, we have our view model or our presenter to be a decision maker. I don't generally like to make my view models make decisions, but I know most people who do view model, model view view model do. And then we have a, a back end decision maker. And the back end decision maker is going to deal with this problem we're talking about here. Um, so, a great situation to have um, a use case or an interactor, or you could even have your repository implementation do this. Um, this is a great use case for that kind of situation, hence the term use case. So, uh, let me show you a code example which addresses a, a problem which is conceptually very similar. Um, just give me a moment here. Ryan EXE is loading. Oops, I, I don't want to show you the uh, history in my search bar for the various porn websites I visit. That's a joke. I have a girlfriend now. Okay, um, let's go to... I totally forgot what I was doing. Space Notes is what I'm doing. Oops, wrong one. There we go. Okay, so um, this project is called Space Notes. It's by me. That's what bracket cove is. Um, it's a multi, a complex multi-module Android application. Uh, the code's a little old. It's two years old, but it, it'll hopefully demonstrate what I would like to demonstrate. Um, and so the problem that we I needed to solve in this application is uh, caching. So I had several local room databases, um, one for registered users and one for unregistered users. The one for registered users had caching. So what could happen is um, it's uh, the user could make a note, they could write a note, and if they're registered, um, what'll happen is the app would cache that transaction in a room database. Um, and then when the user reconnected to the network, um, the app would attempt to push those transactions, those offline transactions, to the um, Firebase remote database. So I'm not using retrofit, but the same idea should hopefully apply. And I'll show you kind of how I did that. Um, this will take a moment because this is a fairly complicated multi-module application. Just give me a moment to find the appropriate classes before I get busy rambling away here and then have to find them anyway. Uh, try 
transaction. Okay, so I'll try and walk you through kind of end to end. I just need to make sure I pick the right class. Uh, note registered. Okay, I think I've got the right code here. Okay, so um, just bearing in mind that thing, I, I, I try to give you almost like a UML thing. So um, so we have our, our front end stuff, our GUI front end architecture. Um, and let's say the user pushes some interaction, some transaction. It, the user does something, but the application is currently online. So we want to cache that um, operation. Uh, and then we want to then also send it to attempt to synchronize it with our remote data source. Hopefully that's clear with everyone. So in this application, I have an interactor or use case. So this is clean architecture stuff. So we'll start there. Um, so this use case here, uh, which encaps, or I'll say interactor, this interactor here holds all of the primary use cases uh, for a registered user. So we can get the data, get notes. Um, we can get a specific note by its ID. We can delete a note. Those are the things that it does. Um, I'm wondering why it doesn't also... There should be an update note here. Oh, update note. <laughs> Good. I, I missed that for a second. I'm like, it does actually update things too. Um, so it's basic CRUD operations, create, read, update, delete. And update does both create and uh, update. Um, so let's say we want to get the notes for the user. So what happens here, actually, sorry, let's start with uh, update. Okay, so we attempt to push the data directly to the remote data source, which is, I'm using a service locator um, and it contains our remote data source. So this would be your retrofit API or your Firebase. Um, and we attempt to push a note, some kind of data to it. Um, and then if the value is, if that occurs successfully, then um, we will uh, get um, a successful operation. That's what remote dot, result dot value means. Um, otherwise, we will just give the note to a local cache, which I call the transaction um, cache, essentially. And so instead of just pushing a note, I push this transaction object. And a transaction, let me just uh, pull it up here. This part's kind of important depending on the situation. Domain. A transaction is just a note, but it also has an enum for the type of transaction. Is it an update or a delete? So I just wanted to show you that. And then to transaction, this is just like a mapper function here. So we, if I can find where I was before, we take uh, we take the note that we tried to push to the remote database and we map it to a transaction object. And um, if it was a delete transaction, that's what we send to the local uh, transaction room database. If it was an update, we send that. All right, so let's move into the um, uh, those things. So the transaction registry, if I can find it, or transaction uh, database, so this is just like a room database. Here we have our DAO, and it'll just give us, it'll push those transactions into the room database. So that part's pretty simple, and hopefully that makes sense. Um, and then we have something kind of in the middle. Sorry, I have so many things open, it's hard for me to even know where I am right now. Um, when we want to synchronize things, so let's say we call get notes. Um, if the transaction database is not empty, 
I first, before I get the data, I want to push those transactions to the remote. So that's what this synchronized transaction cache, cache means. Um, and then what this function will do is it'll tell our uh, repository, our remote repository, um, which basically includes the uh, the transact the transaction local room database. We tell it to synchronize, and then um, where does that happen? Where is this thing? We have our um, repository implementation then coordinated by the interactor as well attempt to synchronize these two things. So we're getting a bit lost in implementation. The point I'm trying to get at here is that you're going to have some kind of class in the back end which will coordinate your um, the dance, so to speak, of your REST API and your room database. And it'll need to know things like, it'll probably need to check to see if the room database is empty. If it's empty, just deal with the REST API. If it's not empty, do what you need to do. Synchronize them um, and attempt to make the REST API, which should be the source of truth probably, uh, accurate. And so that's kind of how I would go about doing it. But I think I'm going to leave that question there because um, it's been a while since I looked at this code and it's really complicated because <laughs> um, I have a room database for uh, unregistered users, a room database for uh, registered um, private storage, room database for transactions, and then a Firebase API for registered uh, private uh, storage so that the user can retrieve their notes on different devices uh, as long as they're logged in. So it, it's hard for me to remember how that thing flows super easily, but hopefully that was kind of useful. All right. Anyways, um, moving on. Uh, Nemanja, um, have you read Eric Evans' Domain Driven Development? What are your thoughts? So um, it's funny, uh, so I've never read this and I've never formally studied uh, Domain Driven Development, but um, I actually do Domain Driven Development. Um, it's something I basically taught myself indirectly. Um, I learned... Uh, some aspects of it. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Gentoo. I, I, I kind of got lost in the implementation there. But hopefully the general idea kind of makes sense. So, um, here, let me explain what how I do domain-driven development. So, um, the, fir the first thing I do, um, let's say, uh, when Ryan designs a new application, um, here's the general process I use. One, user stories slash problem statements. Um, two, um, basically uh, written itemized steps. So this is generally like pseudocode. And then three, I'll write my domain package slash module slash layer. So to show you that I actually do this, um, the very first package I'll create in like any new application will be a domain package. And the domain package will be full of classes and enums and interfaces. And none of these things are allowed to have anything to do with the Android framework, even though, or platform, sorry, even though this is an Android application. Um, you'll only ever see Kotlin standard library and Java standard library in my domain classes. What this allows me to do is it's essentially like creating a foundation for an application and then we build on top of that foundation. 
So when I think about domain-driven design, it means we, we represent the problem domain of the application. So here, this is a Sudoku game. So we represent a Sudoku puzzle, and we represent the different data sources necessary for that thing to work, um, like a, the difficulty of the puzzle, um, the each individual node in the puzzle. Excuse me. I build out a plain standard library representation of the problem domain of Sudoku, in this case, uh, in a package. And then I build everything else around that. So that's what, in a nutshell, domain-driven design means to me, and, and that's how I apply it in my projects. Any other questions? I see we have 17 viewers, so there should be some. Oh, now it's down to 16. I like how YouTube Live gives me like very varying... One of the displays says there's 16 concurrent viewers, and then the other one wildly fluctuates, and I don't know which one to trust. But I'm not that bothered either way. So, any other questions, or do I have to start talking about boxing again or something? Oh! That's okay. I've got time. I can wait. Okay, I'll, I'll try and think of something interesting to talk about. Um, hey, what's up, Akshay? Uh, no, not super late. Do you have a question, though? Uh, MGH has a question. For domain-driven design, do you separate entity from databases and model from service API? Um, so it kind of depends on what you mean by those specific things. And I know that to some people the word entity might be obvious and to others it isn't. But the way I parse that question um, entity from databases. Uh, I separate repositories from databases, so I can show you one example here. If I go in to... Um, oh, this is the wrong project. So um, it really depends on what you mean by entity. And I understand that entity means something pretty specific to like Uncle Bob, or it means probably something pretty specific to Evan. Um, but there's a lot of different definitions for it. Not a lot, there's a few. Um, but I'm generally thinking about a class um, which basically coordinates some kind of database driver or um, tool or framework. And it depends on the situation. So in the back end, I'll generally, depending on how complicated the back end is, I'll have a uh, something which sort of coordinates. It just depends on what you mean by entity. But here I have a back end class, and it coordinates two different data sources, and it it talks to those things through interfaces. So it doesn't know that behind uh, game storage is the um, Android or yeah the Java file storage API and then behind this one is um, proto data store and then within that we're going to have um, our uh, our drivers themselves so the actual thing the 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 framework that we're using to, to store the data so as far as that point is concerned, you can read from that what you want. Is that separating an entity from a database? I don't know exactly what you mean by that. And I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying uh, look at the code and see if that's what I'm doing. As far as separating model from a service API, um, I absolutely separate my domain models from my... Um, 
implementation of my service. And again, hopefully this is what you're talking about, but let me just show you a quick example. So in Fire in Space Notes, this application here, um, we have a domain model is what I would call it, but this isn't what uh, some people think of as domain model, but it's a data model that lives in the domain package or module in this case. So we have our domain module, and then when we need to go into a specific uh, service, hopefully that's what you mean by service. So for example, maybe it's room, maybe it's Firebase, maybe it's whatever, then I will map to and from our domain model to what I would call a data model. Um, so for example, something that has room in it. So for example, a room anonymous note, anonymous room note model is going to have room annotations in it. And so that's why I would map from our plain language domain model to our room specific note. Um, or maybe I need to map to a Firebase note here somewhere to Firebase note. So I think that's what you're asking. And if it is, the answer is yes, I, I do uh, keep the um, domain models separate from the service implementation. The services are allowed to know about our domain models, but our domain obviously can't know anything about any particular service that it's using. Um, it The only thing it knows about them is the interface which they uh, implement. And this is a handy little thing if you're doing multi-module define your interfaces in the domain layer, but create the implementations of those interfaces in your data layer. Um, and then you get the boast of, best of both worlds. You, you have these uh, interfaces which don't know anything about which tools are being used in the back end. It doesn't really know anything about the entities, depending on if that's what you mean. Um, but the, uh, the back end can depend on these things and implement them. So you kind of get the best of both worlds, in my opinion. All right. Now we have some questions. Um, interesting. So MGH, uh, I just see in the chat now, defines an entity as a pure Java class, uh, which is not really how I would define it. But if we go with that definition, and I'm not saying you're wrong. Don't, yeah, don't get it twisted. Uh, well, it looks like I answered your question, MGH. Um, the and entity is a word I don't like to use anymore because what Uncle Bob means by an entity is pretty different from what you mean by an entity, if I recall correctly. And that gets really frustrating, to be honest. Um, but there's no way around it because different teachers use one word for different things and the same word for the same, or many words for, let me try that again. Different teachers and everyone in our industry will use one word that means many things to many people, or they'll use many words to describe the same concept. And that's why it gets really tricky having these conversations. But thankfully, by looking in the code, we had a clear, uh, we were able to clear things up. What's up, Pemba and Mr. Boxy? Oh, this is an interesting, uh, Speculative question. So let me drink some coffee here. Okay. Akshay asks, uh, do you think a software architect is not just about solving programming problems, such as different design patterns and reusability, but also thinking about who slash which level slash experience of a developer will be working and also to consider about the management stuff, such as uh, estimates? Um, so before I proceed, this is obviously a, a, a subjective question. And when I mean that, when I say that, you've got to understand that um, there are people out there who have the title Android Software Engineer or Web Engineer, and they don't actually have a clear understanding of the field of software engineering, a clear understanding of data structures and algorithms, 
and um, runtime and space asymptotic complexity. That's a big scary word, isn't it? So, um, so what I'm trying to say here is I'm going to give you my definition, and that's what you're asking. I'll give you my definition of a software architect, but it's going to mean different things to different people. Um, so, you know, uh, the question here we're asking, is it just about design patterns and reusability, or is it also thinking about kind of what I would think of as um, project management I don't really think so. Um, when I think of a software architect, I do think of someone whose job is specifically to do kind of two things. Um, so, uh-oh, uh-oh. Hopefully my stream isn't lagging. YouTube's sending me a cryptic message. Um, so a software engineer is really going to do two things. Um, they're going to examine the technical technical requirements requirements of the project or feature that they are um, designing. They're going to choose the best patterns and principles which suit the specific project or feature that they are designing. So in a, a nutshell, from a thousand feet in the air, this is really, to me, what a, the two things that um, a uh, um, software architect does. Um, so what would be an example? Uh, let me just give you something that I like to talk about a lot. Um, and I mentioned this earlier. So let's say you've got a team of developers and they're trying to do model view view model and they're running into problems with it. Um, they've either got like a giant view model which does too many things or they've got a giant fragment or a giant view which does too many things. Um, a software architect is going to look at the view and the view model that they're building and they're going to say something like well let me ask a question do you actually need to reuse that view model and if the developers say no excuse me then the software architect is going to say well then don't do mu model view view model that way um, create a field for every widget in the view uh oh my internet is tanking um, well, we've made it pretty far today anyways. Um, create a widget for every field in the view um, and then have fine-grained control over the view within the view model. So that's what I'm talking about here. A software architect is going to look at the technical requirements. They're going to be able to look at the things you're building and make educated decisions about which patterns to use and that kind of thing. So... Um, I don't really consider the job, the role of a software architect to be worrying about project management. But what I would say is that um, if uh, to, to hire someone only for the kind of decisions that I'm talking about is probably pretty rare. So I think um, it's quite likely that you would have someone who is both in charge of designing the overarching software architecture and then also doing some other stuff like that. So very speculative question. Also, if my stream starts lagging here, I apologize. I'm getting some minor uh, internet issues again. And unfortunately, there's just nothing I can do to fix them. Um, but oh well. So yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on that. Um, but it's totally subjective. OK. Uh, Mr. Boxy asks, uh, just Im implemented access object pattern for repository pattern. Just have a question. Is it worth spending time creating your own patterns for bigger projects? Um, I 
I'm slightly perturbed by what you mean by creating your own uh, patterns. I'm assuming you mean uh, implementing them um, for bigger projects. I um, I'm not sure if I'm really grasping your question because I'm temp. Oh, there goes my bit rate to zero. So um, we'll see how long we can go on before my internet completely dies. Um, I'm tempted to say that the, the most important time to use these kinds of patterns is in bigger projects. So I'm not totally sure what you mean. Um, you know, something I... Uh, learned and I've come to really appreciate from uh, with Douglas Schmidt. Uh, so I don't really watch any other YouTuber with any regularity except Douglas Schmidt and he talks a lot about um, uh, what are they called? Pattern. So there's uh, design patterns and then there's pattern sequences he calls them. And so a pattern sequence is essentially like a collection of design patterns which go together. Um, and maybe I can find some kind of example to explain what I mean by that. Just give me a moment here. So what I think of as a, a pattern sequence is, is something like uh, what I've got here. So we've got what looks like just, you know, a software architecture diagram and it, it doesn't go into a lot of detail. Um, but really what I'm doing here is I'm putting together several different patterns to create a pattern sequence. So what are some examples? Let's look at the view talking to the uh, presentation logic. So in this situation, And I'm going to um, hilariously embarrass myself by stating very plainly that um, game logic. By stating very plainly that I can't remember the name. I can't remember if this is the. Uh, this is either the. I think this the strategy pattern or the command pattern. But I can't remember, and I, I don't really care because um, I remember these things in code a lot better than I remember the jargon names. But, for example, from the view to the presentation logic, um, I have a single function which accepts a generic event class. So in this case, active game event. And this event class represents every possible interaction the user can make with that particular part of the user interface. And then this is the way that the view will talk to the active game logic. So there's like a single entry point here. Um, and then another thing that I do is in the view model, when the active game logic updates the view model, um, it actually exposes these sort of observable fields. In this case, I'm just using function types, which is basically like a poor man's implementation of the observer pattern. And then um, I'll, of course, use uh, the repository pattern to talk to the back end. And I'm also um, using, in a sense, the dispatcher provider here is, is basically like a service locator. So what I'm getting at here is that on the surface, it looks like I'm just following something akin to model view, view model, but it also has a presenter. But the way I'm wiring all these different things together, elements of my program, is using a variety of patterns together to create a pattern sequence, uh, which is what Doug Schmidt calls it. So um, I'm not sure if that really addresses your question. Um, my experience with design patterns is that um, particularly in larger and complex applications or, or medium scale, um, they really tend to complement each other and you can start to actually 
create your own pattern sequences. Uh-oh, my stream just died. Oh my god, YouTube, stop trolling me. Okay, I don't know. YouTube is telling me that... Oh, there we go. Okay, YouTube was telling me there was no data being transmitted. Okay. Anyways, um, so yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on that particular thing. Man, I'm really uh, annoyed about this internet problem. This is getting really frustrating. Anyways, moving on. Um, oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, just readdressing that question, um, Mr. Boxy, yeah, this, that's what I meant by pattern sequences. Um, yeah, it, it is worth, um, especially in larger and complex projects, it, it's worth learning several patterns and then seeing how they all fit together and creating these big pattern sequences is what Doug Schmidt called them. So I do think that's worth it. All right. Um, oh boy, Terrell, it's, it's been a, a while since I've coded a Java recycler view, but I think I do have an... Uh, just give me a moment. And this will probably be the last question I answer because my internet is, again, being spotty and I'm pretty irritated about that. Um, and I have no idea how to fix it because I already bought a $130 antenna to fix it. Give me a moment to find the Java source. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm just pasting the link to this source code in the description box for you, uh, Terrell. If, I think that was your name. Um, and I'll just walk you through what I do in Java for recycler views. And you're right, it, it's tricky to do this elegantly. Um, let's do, uh, what is it, day view, I think, or task list view. Let's do day view. Okay, um, so the way that I approach this problem, uh, and it is a tricky problem, so let me just talk about why it's a tricky problem. Um, so adapters are, are annoying. Um, and in this case, I'm talking about a recycler view adapter. And the reason why they're annoying is tight coupling. At the start of the show, if you've been here the whole time, I talked about uh, loose coupling um, and it being a good thing. Um, now we're talking about tight coupling. So um, adapters are tricky because they do two things. They kind of coordinate things and make decisions and they're also like totally tightly coupled to the view hierarchy. And anytime you're tightly coupled to Android's view hierarchy, it creates the kind of problems you would expect when tight coupling occurs. So in order to find a solution here, um, we need to somehow pull this code apart. And that's how I try and solve this problem of dealing with a recycler view and its adapter. So I'll give you a quick overview. So the view um, holds on to the, uh, the recycler view here and um, it also holds on to the adapter but what happens is the logic class ends up coordinating these different things it ends up coordinating the view 
and telling the view what to do. So within the view, when the logic class, so this would be your presenter or your view model, gives the data to the view, we create our adapter and we bind it uh, to the recycler view. So we pass the data in here. And then there's another thing we do. So where is, uh, let's find the adapter, day adapter. So there's a number of ways to handle the callback. Um, you could actually, this is the one situation where I like live data. <laughs> So when you create your adapter, you either need a, an interface, a callback, or you could use a function uh, in Java. It's called a method. What is it called? A method reference? They had to call it something silly. I think a method reference. Or you can even use live data. I've done that before. And um, you pass these things, and when you create your adapter, you'll register that callback with the adapter. Um, what you'll do, and please bear with me, I haven't looked at this code in like three years, I think. So it'll take me a moment to remember how it works. In onbind view holder, um, we will set an on click listener to our view holder and that on click listener will respond to shit i picked uh, an example which doesn't use swipe to delete okay let me back out of this <laughs> and pull something else up i apologize i forgot that you asked about swipe to delete specifically uh, let me pull up an example which actually uses that what I said before still applies, but you want swipe to delete. Maybe I got to go even older. Boom demo. Just give me a moment here. list item swiped oh man you know what I'm really sorry I don't think I have a Java source that I can show you because the only one I do have is ancient so I've got this um, recycler view tutorial 2017 and this is an old tutorial and um, it has an implementation of what I'm trying to show you Ah, oh, that's too bad. So the best thing I can do for you for now, unfortunately, is to show you something that's written in Kotlin. And I'm not even sure if you're interested in that. So I apologize. I thought the Samsara day planner would be a good example, but I forgot that it doesn't actually implement swipe to delete. So that's kind of exactly what you're asking about. Uh, hopefully what I can do is um, just give you a general tip here. Um, Pull your adapter out into a separate class 
and give it, uh, there's a couple different things you can do. You could give it a callback interface, which is what I showed you before. This is also the one situation where I like to use live data, um, is I actually use live data as just an observable here, uh, which is, think of it conceptually as very similar to using an interface callback. And it um, uh, basically, uh, where is our event class? Um, so what happens is we have this one interface or this one live data, or in Kotlin, you can just use like a function type. And it returns an object called note list event. And this object note list event, which you could use an enum class or something like that. This is the problem because it's a Kotlin example, but you can do this in Java. Um, is capable of representing clicks or uh, swipe events or whatever you want, really. And then what happens is, um, oh, this one doesn't have swipe to delete either. I really thought it did. Well, this is just crashing and burning. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. This is what happens when Ryan tries to teach people with ancient code. I was sure it had swipe to delete. Now I'm terribly confused. Which happens? Do I set up the swipe in here? Just give me a moment. Okay, I'm sorry, folks. I think I'll have to just alt QQ out of this one because I can't find the, the code I'm trying to demonstrate and that's kind of important to ex answer the question. Sorry about that, folks. You know, sometimes uh, it becomes very difficult to answer a specific implementation question if I can't find the implementation of what I'm trying to explain. Uh, okay, sorry about that. You know, yep, absolute pro. You're right, Jordan. So um, what I was trying to tell you is um, you want a, uh, you want your adapter to hold on to either an, an interface which holds a, uh, a sealed class. And that's not going to help you in Kotlin. Um, I can't, yeah, I can't help you with this one. And that's really going to bug me because I know somewhere in my like 38 repositories that I solved this problem in Java. but I can't seem to find the example that I'm looking for. Just let me look one more time for this. Uno momento, por favor. Or I guess un momento. Okay. Uh, note. Note list. And who implements... Okay, yeah, apparently I don't have a good example available. Sorry, I did my best. Anyways, let's move on to another question. Uh, thanks for joining, Tracks. All right, so anyways, we're going to move on to a different question. And, you know, it's, it's important to... Uh, 
this is a useful time to teach something, which is that um, when you do a live show and you're in front of other people, sometimes you're gonna screw up or you're not gonna find the code example that you're looking for. And your entire answer to the question is dependent on doing that. And because um, I could like wave my hands and verbally explain that you uh, need to loosely couple your adapter and the item decorator, and then you need to end up calling back to your presentation logic class or your view model. Um, essentially, you need to apply loose coupling. But if I don't have the code to actually show how to do that, then it's not really that useful to someone watching. So, hey, sometimes I screw up. But uh, it's important to understand that everybody screws up sometimes. So, um, anyways, moving on, Akshay asks, any plan for starting game development tutorial? Um, I think you'll be a good person to explain game development with C++. Uh, not really. So the important thing with uh, game, with uh, the tutorials I make, is that a single long form tutorial can literally take two months to make. So uh, people don't really understand what it's actually like to be a content creator who's actually good at coding. Um, it would be easier for me to be just a programmer. It would be easier for me to be just a content creator who just does beginner stuff all the time. I've always tried to be a good programmer and a content creator who teaches more advanced stuff. And so for me to like really go in and make a C++ game development tutorial, I'd have to spend probably about six months to a year learning that. I am okay with C++, but I've never done any game development. So I don't really plan to make a tutorial on that. Um, I will be making tutorials hopefully for interpreter or compiler development and eventually for machine learning. I'm not sure if game development is something I'll ever get into, but never say never. So anyways, um, all right, folks. Well, after that complete blunder and my repeated internet issues, I think I'm going to call it a day for today, but I'd like to thank everyone for joining and uh, hopefully there was some useful content. If you're just joining later on, you'll probably want to watch the first part of this video uh, where I explain the uh, inversion of control, what that is, and uh, how it relates to dependency injection, and um, uh, service locator, and interfaces, and how those things all go together to create loose coupling. And related to the question about the recycler view, the reason why it's so difficult and you see so many bad code examples out there is the problem of tight coupling. And um, so, yeah, anyways, uh, we have one. I'll just do one quick question here uh, by Aditya and then I'll call it a day. So Aditya asks, this is not related to today's topic. As a beginner, I want to build projects, but I don't know how to start and how to do pre-production planning on any project. Um, so I watched a couple of YouTubers playlists and follow those projects. Is it a good way of learning things, or am I in the tutorial hell? Um, well, let me give you something here. I will share with you a video which will show you the process I use for planning projects and paste it in the content there. So this video is called how to, sorry, just one second, um, how to design information systems and applications. And it, it will give you a, a specific repeatable systematic process for designing new projects from start to um, basically writing your first domain classes. And it's very simply explained. Um, and this is a really important question that you asked because um, uh, being able to having a process to design different features or new parts of your application is critically important. And it irritates me that oftentimes courses or teachers don't teach that because there's a specific way you can do it. And I explained it in that video um, and it's very systematic. Um, now, the second part of your question is, so I watched a couple of YouTubers playlists and follow those projects. Is it a good way of learning things or am I in the tutorial hell? It depends on the YouTuber. 
Um, if it's me and I'm doing something from start to finish, I'll try and explain my decision-making process or I, I'll explain that I didn't actually start writing the code here. I followed my design process, which occurs before I write the code. Excuse me. Um, so it really depends. But following uh, full app tutorials or code along tutorials where you build a whole, whole project from start to finish, um, if the teacher is good and the quality of the code they're writing is good, then I think that's a great way to learn. I actually prefer to learn that way as opposed to like reading random tutorials on individual topics. To me, tutorial hell would be like getting stuck learning these individual things in isolation and not building a robust, uh, interesting application. And as a beginner, it's difficult to, to build a large, complicated application um, or a medium-sized complicated application. But the truth is that um, you really need to push yourself in that way. If you have your basic programming skills, you do want to build something larger and more meaningful. And that's really what you need to do to take yourself from a junior developer to an intermediate developer. So anyways, Aditya follows up. Uh, how do I know those are good or bad from my perspective as a beginner? Which is a great point. Um, you have to look for people who have a good reputation. So um, for me, here's, you know, for uh, Android stuff, um, I quite like um, uh, Don Felker. Um, you can find specific repositories. So Android, if you're into like Jetpack stuff, you could do um, Android architecture blueprints. Um, Android, uh, what's the other one called? Jetpack samples, I think, um, are two examples. Uh, you could look at some of my code. Um, so that's kind of the main thing. Um, I try to find good quality uh, code repositories that are open source to learn from is a great example. So I would check these out from the uh, Google samples GitHub repository. Very good question though. Um, here's a great example. If a course is super popular on Udemy, um, it might actually still be full of crappy code and it's just that the people that made the course are very good at marketing. Um, but if it's someone who's respected in the, uh, in the community, that's one way to, to know. Anyways, I'm going to call it a day. Uh, thank you so much for watching everybody. And, uh, yeah, hopefully I will see you next weekend. Um, we'll see regarding some housekeeping. There's a pretty high possibility that I will be moving in something like 20 to 40 days. Um, so we'll actually have to see. Uh, I might have to take a break from my live streams, the Q&As during that process, but I don't really know. There's a lot of things up in the air. Um, if you are um, actually curious about my personal life, um, my girlfriend is a med student and um, she's either going to be staying in Alberta or possibly moving here to BC, which is where I live, and we don't know yet. So it might be that I'm moving to Alberta. So um, there's a lot of moving parts going on and we'll just have to see uh, how that kind of works out. But however long of a break I need to take between doing these live streams, um, I will get back to it eventually. And for the time being, I will still be streaming next Sunday, assuming my internet works. So thank you so much for watching. Pratik says, thanks to all Canadian citizens for sending COVID aid to India. Uh, my heart goes out to everyone in India um, we have a, a, a huge population of people, uh, immigrants from India, um, and, uh, you know, it, it's honestly my image of like Canadian culture includes people from all kinds of backgrounds, but uh, native um, Indian, Chinese, and white people like me, we all make up Canada. When you walk around in a big city in Canada, you see people from all kinds of different cultures. And so it's uh, very, um, you know, my heart goes out to everyone there because COVID sucks. And I'm glad that their, uh, our government is helping out as much as they can. Agam has one last question. You better make it quick.
I'll give you like 30 seconds and maybe I'll answer it. And no, I'm not going to answer that question. My suggestion to you, Agam, is to buy, uh, get, um, uh, look at Coding in Flow, Florian. Um, I think Florian from Coding Flow has some tutorials on paging. And uh, Florian would be an example of someone I'm happy to point you to because uh, uh, he has a good reputation. And it's been actually pretty awesome to see how... Um, how much better of a developer Florian has gotten in the past two years. And I, I'm not trying to say, uh, I'm not trying to say he was bad before, uh, but he, he's, uh, it's really, it's one thing, like he's always been way better at me at running a YouTube channel and that's pretty obvious. But uh, I always used to kind of feel like, well, I'm a better programmer than him kind of thing. And at this point, it's just really nice to see that he's really taken his um, coding skills to the next level. So very happy to suggest his course and channel. But yeah, I'm not going to answer that question. So good luck, Agam. Thanks, everybody. Peace out.